This is Adrian Warnock's Christian Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon and welcome to The Exchange with Ed Stetzer, where Ed Stetzer is away. He's actually out of the country right now in Brazil. And so my name is Micah Fries. I'm the vice president of LifeWay Research, hanging out with you here on a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, Ed will be back here soon. Thankful for him and thankful for his influence around the globe. And I'd encourage you to pray for him while he's serving the church in, uh, in Brazil this week. We are really excited. As, as we think about the content of our conversation today, I was doing a little research, and it's interesting to me. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, 10 years ago this year, in 2004, declared blog their word of the year. Kind of, it, it gave evidence to the explosion of what is now known as social media. And of course, at the time, blogs were sort of the dominant player on the scene uh, when it came to social media. Today, social media has grown, and you know there's Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and, and so on. In fact, at the time that blog was declared the word of the year by Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, Facebook was just being founded in February of t- 2004 in a dorm room with you know, Mark Zuckerberg there at Harvard. And then just the following year, Twitter would be created. And of course, now they've both sort of consumed the social media world. Nonetheless, blogging had sort of come onto the uh, scene and had become a, a substantive force. And at the time, you know, blogging was a little bit like a wild, wild west. I mean, just anybody can, could get in at any time. And, and really, that was one of the strengths of blogging. Anybody who had, a, uh, had something to say could jump in at any time and gain an audience. And, of course, the weakness of social media and blogging in particular was that anybody who had something to say could jump in and gain an audience and a platform. But nonetheless, uh, blogging, social media, that sort of thing began to have substantive influence uh, on the world as we know it. And today, of course, all of our world is shaped by blogging and other forms of social media. Even the, uh, the largest news outlets in the world are using it as a primary means of driving their information. And so uh, one of the things that we've seen in respect to blogging and you know, Facebook, Twitter, social media explosion is that Christians in particular have been quick to take advantage of the, uh, of the platform of blogging and social media and have used it maybe in ways that very few other segments of society or domains and culture have used it. Uh, we've been very effective. In fact, this show is, is exclusively right now on you know, blog, social media type content. We push it out uh, on a blog, it's shown online, and then of course we you know, publicize it through Facebook and Twitter. In fact, some of you right now are engaging with us on Twitter, and I'd encourage you to do that using you know, hashtag the exchange or our brand new Twitter feed, which is ex- exchange underscore show. We'd love for you to engage with us uh, you know, using those social media uh, avenues, and then as you engage with us during the show, we're going to go ahead and pose some of those questions to our guest this morning. Now, our guest, our our main guest today is Adrian Warnock. Uh, that's a name that's going to be very, very familiar to you. He's from Great Britain here in the U.S. with us, actually in studio today. We're thankful to have him. And Adrian is one of those who has used social media um, in powerful and profound ways. It doesn't matter what list you go out and try and find in terms of influential evangelicals in the blog world. Adrian's going to be up there in the top 20, top 10 depending on the list uh, that you you go out and try and find. Adrian has used his blog to advance the message of the gospel, the implications of the gospel in powerful and profound ways. And we want to have a conversation with him about that today. But because of that platform, Adrian has been able to engage in in a variety of other ways. He's written a fantastic book on the resurrection that I want to have a conversation with him about today. And what I love about Adrian is not only are all those things true, but he is intimately connected to his local church, serves on a leadership team, We're going to talk to him about about why he chooses to do that here in just a few minutes. But I'm thankful for the advance of social media, thankful for the fact that we get to take advantage of it, and you do too. Hope that you're engaging with us today uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, using the the hashtag The Exchange. And we're going to come back in just a moment with Adrian Warnock, have a conversation about those different aspects of social media and the the way the Lord's used that in his life. So engage with us, watch these uh, promos, and we'll be back in just a moment. What will happen when we have churches that really... Let the word of Christ dwell in them richly. What will happen when we have teenagers and children who really let the word of Christ dwell in them richly? We think marriages are going to be healthy. We think churches are going to be transformed, that communities are going to be impacted as Christians start to obey the text in their context, in their setting. You think about the Bible. The Bible is uh, the revelation of God. In fact, John says that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. If we are to know God, then we must know him through the Bible. 
Explore the Bible will help us to do that. So the heart behind Explore the Bible really is Colossians 3, 15, and 16. Let the peace of Christ control your hearts. Verse 16 is, let the word of Christ dwell among you richly. So we want to say, hey, churches, church leaders, pastors, do you want a congregation? Do you want a small group? Do you want a Sunday school class filled with people that speak to one another in wisdom, that encourage each other, that admonish one another, that uh, are filled with gratitude in their hearts to God, that they sing and they celebrate the salvation that God's given them? Do you want a group of people like that? Then you have to let the word of Christ dwell among them richly. The exploration of the Bible, book by book, for groups of all ages, from uh, senior adults to adults to young adults to students to kids of all ages. If everyone is studying the same book, imagine the possibility of revival based upon the study together in community as a group studying the text in its context. Imagine the possibility of letting the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Whenever we're squeezed, whenever people in our groups or in our churches are squeezed, whatever's in them is going to come out. If the Word of Christ is deeply in them, then that's what's going to come. They're going to speak to one another with wisdom. They're going to sing songs to God. They're going to be filled with gratitude. What's in you is going to come out of you. And so we want to do everything we can to help churches and help small groups and Sunday school classes get the Word of Christ deeply, richly in the people. Welcome back to what the will exchange. Happen when we have church. We're so excited to have you here this afternoon and thankful that you would be engaging with us. Remember to be engaging with us on social media. You can use hashtag the exchange on Twitter and Facebook. We'll be uh, checking those streams, trying to get your questions, and we'll be posing those questions to our guests today. But we do have a brand new Twitter account that we're using for the show. It's exchange underscore show, exchange underscore show. Uh, but if you would, do us a favor, go follow that. Maybe retweet a couple of things out of there. Let your friends know about it. We'd love to help build up some followers. And that leads us perfectly into our conversation, which is about social media. Our guest today is Adrian Warnock. So thankful to have Adrian come all the way across the pond, right, to hang out with us. We were talking about soccer or football a minute ago, and you told yeah. me you're not even a big soccer fan. No, I'm not. I'm, it's I'm, tragic, Adrian. <laughs> yeah, I'm more of a motor racing guy. I like the Yank is a bigger uh, soccer fan than you. <laughs> Adrian, my brother though, is, my, and my son. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that at least. Adrian is, um, interestingly enough, Adrian, you're known by probably most of our audience for being a blogger. Sure. Uh, you've been blogging for 11 years. Yeah. You know, blog. I talked about it in the opening. Blog was the word of the, the year for Merriam-Webster Dictionary in 2004, but you've been blogging since 2003. Yeah. Now you blog on the Pathios platform, mm-hmm. which is a huge blogging platform for Christians and others. Uh, but what I love about you is that's really not your identity. I mean, mm. that's probably how you're known in many ways. Uh, but your identity is wife. Husband, uh, I mean, husband, husband to your yes. wife, father to five kids. Is That's that right. right? Yeah. Father to five kids. Serve on the leadership team at Jubilee Church right. there in London. And what is astonishing, really, to a number of our watchers is you're a doctor. I yes, mean, you're a res- medical doctor. Yeah. Medical doctor in the research field. And, uh, yeah. and so all of these things, and then you have time in your spare time to run one of the largest Christian blogs yeah. in the world. And then on top of all of that, you wrote this incredible book, Raised with Christ. I read it a few years ago when I first got a copy of it, when you and I first met yeah. uh, three or four years ago. And uh, I'm thankful for it. We're going to get around in just a few minutes to talking some more about Raised with Christ and the influence of the resurrection. But I kind of want to start, Adrian, by talking about just blogging and social media. Yeah. You're heavily invested in it. Why are, you, why are you so heavily invested in it? How did you begin in it? Why, why does this okay. matter to you? Well, I must admit it was an accidental discovery one day. Okay. I, was, I was a little bored. That's one, one thing about me. I do get a bit bored. So I need Which to do... clearly you do yeah. because you're doing so many things. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and I just, I'd heard about this blogging thing. I had had a website for a while before that, actually. And, um, and I was familiar with some of the other early websites. So I'm, I'm thinking of um, Spurgeon.org, sure. which was one of the first Christian websites I was aware of on CCL.org. And, and I just think I, I, I was also around very disorganized. So I thought if I start one of these blogs, I could use it as a bit like an online scrapbook. That was sure. what the mentality was. I, I could put some ideas there. I could put some quotes there that I might otherwise lose that maybe I could use in a sermon or something. And, and I did have some sort of idea that maybe my children would look at it, you know, when I was gone. There was right. a bit of a morbid archive. thought. Yeah, kind of <laughs> early midlife crisis, sure. maybe 10, sure. 11 years ago. Um, and, and I just 
really didn't have any idea of where, where the hurricane that, that blogging has, has become would, would, would lead me, Yuli. You know, one of the things that's interesting that I was thinking of as I was preparing for this, in the early days when you started blogging, yeah. 03, 04, 05, all the way, you know, 06 and 07, blogging was kind of a wild, wild west. People thought I was nuts. Well, people think a lot of bloggers are nuts. <laughs> yeah. You're not alone in that yeah. identification. But what was interesting to me, really anyone with a voice could find a platform and get mm. an audience. That's not necessarily true today. The readership has coalesced yeah. around some influential, substantive blogs. And I mean, I'm not saying that anybody can't get a voice. Yeah. I think it's harder, harder. today. It's definitely harder. It's yeah. harder. And, but your voice is one of those voices that people have sort of coalesced around, and they find you to be trustworthy. How have you built up um, a trustworthy reputation and an audience that continues to come back for more? Well, it's, it's an interesting question. If I, if I knew the answer to that, I could probably... <laughs> Write a book and make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, maybe not. No, but I think, I think for me, really, I, I just blog about what interests me. Okay. Um, and, and I think, in a sense, that's very straightforward. And I think it's that personal connection that people like. Mm -hmm. A lot of group blogs don't really work. Not so much I'm talking about the, the platforms, but you know, the difference with the platforms is you've got lots sure. of voices there, but right. each voice has its own area and its each voice channel. has control, their own yeah. channel. Right. And so you can engage with someone as a person. And I think that's what's the draw. Um, and so for whatever reason, people must find the, the witterings of a, of a UK, I mean, maybe that helps, sure. although the accent isn't there much, um, you know, medical doctor, although a lot of people don't know I'm a medical doctor. But I do think maybe I... I Perhaps I appeal to a broad range of, e of evangelicals, yeah. you know, on the more reformed end, on the, you know, the more kind of, you know, not, not quite what you might call the evangelical, typical evangelical end, even through to the charismatic end and the Pentecostal end, um, because I sort of sit somewhere in the middle. Sure. Uh, one of my early popular posts was just called, I want it all. Mm -hmm. Why should I have to choose between being biblically robust and... Uh, and, and emotionally, if you like, engaged to church and all that, that side of things. So sure. I guess I've just... Also, I think the other thing that's probably helped is I've constantly tried to point people elsewhere. Mm -hmm. In fact, I remember at some points so I was literally trying to say, go away. <laughs> <laughs> and and the more I did that, the, you know, saying, look, look, at this, look at this guy, look at this quote, look at this thing. And I think that's where social media can, can really be helpful to... You know, if you think about 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 people, you know, sharing things that interest them mm -hmm. to help those things, you know, come to the top, if you like, help right. us find our way through the maze of, of knowledge that's out there now. You know, in, in, in that sense, Adrian, blogging, social media, Facebook, Twitter, and the like, really is a democratic platform, yeah. right? It's, it's yeah. sort of whoever just has a voice is able to engage. Yeah. So let me ask you this, because you mentioned when you were originally thinking about engaging, you thought maybe this could be helpful to compile some data for my sermons. Yeah. And I want to talk about your church involvement here in a minute. But specifically, how has your engagement in social media lent itself or helped your ministry in the local church? Okay, well, I think one thing that it's done more than probably anything is changed me. Okay. Um, I think what, what it does is it forces you to engage with real people as opposed to straw men. I think if we're in a particular subset of the church it's very easy to paint a picture of someone over there sure, and, and right. throw a stone straw at them man. straw man you yeah. know the whole thing yeah. and of course you know you write something and maybe you're a bit guilty of that and what you find is people who actually genuinely do that come <laughs> lump, lunging on your That's side right. and tell you how foolish you are That's right. and the next thing you know you're in the middle of a storm now i've learned over the years with a lot of mistakes uh, to be able to sharpen my communication, sharpen my own understanding of some of these issues, and actually the complexity of some of these issues. We, we tend to turn them into black or white, whereas right. the reality is they're more of a spectrum in many right. cases. Yeah, I think that's been helpful for me too, Adrian. I think just being able to refine my own theology. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, surprisingly, I remember when Twitter first came onto the scene, yeah. and I can, I can distinctly remember telling my wife, I'm not going to engage in that. That's stupid. You know, why would you only use yeah. 140 characters? You can't say anything of substance. Of course, today I'm heavily, I love Twitter. I'm all over yes. it, right? I may spend a lot of time on it. But I found that even in that concise platform, yeah. it's forced me to streamline and edit myself in yeah. a way that has helped me to deepen my own faith, I think. Yeah. And so, you know. I agree. Well, I mean, John Piper says that sentences change lives. Right. And I think he's right. And if you think about, you know, most of the key verses in the Bible mm -hmm. that, that you would hone in on and, and feel were important and popular and significant, sure. you can fit most of those onto a Twitter yeah. tweet. Often. I think you're right. So let me ask you this then. As you've engaged in social media, you've, you know, you're obviously of substance in the blog world. How have you seen this, uh, God use this, 
to engage people's lives? How have you seen God move in people's lives through your engagement on social media? Well, I mean, I think, you know, there are people get the opportunity to be exposed to things that they, they wouldn't otherwise be exposed to. So um, you might find, for example, someone who was exploring a particular theological sure. issue, uh, and, and they may not have time to read a whole book, so they can read a pricey of that, and maybe a book review. I mean, certain bloggers have done very well on writing right. book reviews. Yeah, yeah. I don't do that as much as I perhaps could, but I will sometimes take the issues or the you know little idea, and so rather than spending a few hours reading a book, you can mm-hmm. literally spend five minutes, digest an idea, right. short article, and that can step by step, drip by drip, begin to change you, at least make you appreciate what someone else says, if nothing else. Um, but sometimes I think it can lead to radical changes in, in our thinking um, and, and, and reconfigurations. And certainly it can lead to relationships as well, which has been quite something that I never really expected. Because I think in the early days, you tend to think of the online world and right. the real world. That's right. I've, I've yeah, noticed that's right. less and less people are talking about in real life anymore. Sure. Because actually the online world is real life. I mean, that's many right. of our problems online are when we stop realizing it's real life and start right. treating it like it's not. But actually, you know, I've met so many friends. Uh, I've met so many partners in ministry, people that, you know, we've ended up, you know, doing things together with, uh, projects together like the book and, and other things as well that, that would never have come about if I'd not met the person involved through the internet. I yeah. mean, we met online. We did. We did. And then met and in, then person in person a few office. years ago. Yeah. yeah. And when you came in and spoke about the book in our town. I'm thankful for that. You know, one of the things that I've been prone to say recently, Adrian, is that social media is no longer a tool for yeah. communication, that it's it's beyond a tool, it's a language, right? And, yeah. I, and I think that's been one of the struggles for some in ministry to, to understand, is it's not just a tool. If it's a tool, then it's negotiable. Yeah. But in contemporary culture, it's become a language. If we don't speak it, we don't communicate. Yeah, and it's a bit like not having a phone. Right, sure. I mean, you could just about survive in the world without a phone today, but it'd be pretty hard. Be and you'd, <laughs> you'd kind of be relying on secretaries or something to take phone sure. calls for you or to make phone calls or to book things. And, and I think social media, the Internet in general, really, is becoming like that, if not already like that. Right. Uh, and certainly, you know, anyone who is aspiring to be an author, for example, I think you're going to find that you know, one of the first questions that a publisher is going to ask you is, well, do you have a social media channel? Do That's you right. have an audience already? Mm-hmm. If you don't, well, go back and tell us when you do. Even if right. you've got a, a large church sometimes, right. you know, right. um, it's actually almost more important, not, not just whether the people in your church will buy your book, because, you know, how many churches are big That's enough right. to, to, to justify right. that? Sure. Uh, even if you get 100% of them to buy right. it, it's still not really enough. Um, you need to have that broader audience in order to get people to buy your book. Now, that's a reality. Some some people feel that's unhelpful. Um, And you could see it as a negative thing. But actually, I see it as an opportunity for people to not just build an audience, but to prove to themselves that they can write and to improve in their writing. And that's certainly helpful for me. One of the other values that I've seen come out of social media, Adrian, has been the flattening of the evangelical world in this sense that pre- social media to a large degree, we sort of siloed with our communities and with our tribes, right? I mean, we went to the conferences where our folks spoke at, we read their books, they preached in our churches. Social media has sort of engaged evangelical culture uh, all the way across the board. And so you see people, you know, you see Presbyterians yeah. influencing Charismatics and you see sure. Charismatics influencing Baptists. And you, see, you know, I mean, yeah, you yeah, see yeah, this, yeah. this flattening of the evangelical world that in many ways has been helpful, I think. To well, advance. that's right. I, I mean, one of the first people I really engaged with was a, was a chap who went by the name of Jolly Blogger, David Wayne. He's, sure. he's not really online anymore. He's, unfortunately, he's unwell, but he, you know, he's still around. But he, um, he and I used to engage so much. Um, and it was funny because he was a Presbyterian. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, he was the first... Uh, Presbyterian that I'd ever engaged with in any sort of serious way, because we don't really have that many in the UK, although it is growing sure. over there now. They're, they're mostly in the Anglicans, if, right. if they're from yeah. that, that, that right. background. So, but we were so connected on so many issues that actually there were some people who, who thought we were the same person, just pretending to mm. be two different people, right. but we really That's were funny. not. Um, <laughs> and, and we found that often we'd try and have an argument, mm-hmm. and even when it was on an issue that should divide us, mm-hmm. that we thought we were very much apart, we would find that actually once we took the time to actually understand what the other person was saying, rather than just hearing what we thought they were saying, we were actually a lot closer than we thought we'd be. Yeah, I think that's helpful. We're we're talking to Adrian uh, Warnock today. We're thankful to have him here live with us in studio here in Nashville from Great Britain, from the UK. And uh, we're going to come back in just a minute. We're going to have a conversation with him about his engagement at at the local church level and why he finds that to be a value. I hope that's encouraging to you. Remember to engage with us on social media using hashtag the exchange or our new Twitter handle exchange underscore show. We'll be back in just a second. Watch these spots and, and we'll return with a conversation with Adrian Warnock.
people are searching for something. They don't always know it's God they're looking for. They seem to look for him in the wrong places. God says people will find him when they search for him with all their heart. That sounds easy, but it's not. I think churches are supposed to help people find God. I wonder if some churches have stopped helping. Some people know where God is, but they keep running from Him. Maybe they'll bump into Him by accident. If they do, I don't think it was an accident. God says he's come to give you a big life. We should help people remember that. Welcome back to The Exchange. My name is Micah Fries, the uh, Vice President of LifeWay Research. We're excited to have you here as we continue to have this conversation with one of uh, Christianity's most influential bloggers, uh, extremely influential on social media, Adrian Warnock. Adrian is the author of Raised with Christ. Uh, we're excited about this book. It's a fantastic book. If you've not read it yet, you need to go ahead and get a copy. If you're on the website, you should be able to just kind of look below the video uh, and be able to click on that link and grab a copy for yourself. We're going to have a conversation about the book here in just a second. But before we do that, Adrian, I want to talk to you a little bit about your church. You are you're a doctor, hmm. uh, you're a medical doctor, you work in the research field. Obviously, that's a great career field yeah. for folks to be in. Um, would be considered a successful career field by almost everybody. You're also blogging all the time, and yet you're still part of the leadership team at Jubilee Church, hmm. part of the regular preaching team. Why in the world... And I've got to be honest with you, I'm, I'm setting you up with this conversation because I work full-time at LifeWay and I'm a yeah. non-paid pastor at my church yeah. too. And so I, I'm, I'm, I believe in this. Why would you take the time to be involved in a local church in that way? Well, I think because Jesus commands us to for a start. That's good. You know, uh, I mean, Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and I will be with you always to the ends of the earth. Now, we say we want Jesus to be with us, um, but if we want him to be with us, we need to obey his commands, mm -hmm. and particularly the last command he gave. You know, it's pretty important. Uh, so obviously, I, last time I checked, it's pretty hard to really make a disciple or to baptize someone online. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying it can't contribute. Certainly right. to the being, becoming a disciple thing, for sure there's, there's some elements that can help, but there's no real substitute for getting in someone's face, uh, having a bit of face time, being part of a family, um, part of people who know what you're really like, who can see what your kids are like, can see what your wife is like, uh, and, and just to be part of a community. That, that's so important. Mm -hmm. Discipleship was what Jesus told them to do. And what did they do to do that, to follow that command? They went and planted churches. Sure. And the church is God's pl pl plan A for the world. Right. Uh, there is no plan B. Other things can support the church for sure, mm -hmm. but the church is the primary way in which God blesses us, I believe. And I've been so blessed by being part of that church. Since 1995, I've been part of that church. So long wow. before I was a blogger, sure. long before I was an author. Um, and uh, I've learned so much. And it's a real pleasure to, and privilege to be there. Uh, Topi Colioso, the leader there who spoke at Desiring God uh, just over a year ago now, uh, is my pastor. And it's a thrill to call him my pastor. And I wouldn't do any of this stuff if I didn't have somebody 
that I could submit to, if you like, sure. and, and, and have input from. And, and I'm not a pastor. I am on the leadership team. Uh, and I like to contribute, to give back a bit, really, as, as my gifts allow and as my time allows to, to serve the church that's blessed me so much. But I think that does beg the question, then, Adrian. It's, it's one thing to love the church. It's another thing mm. to be a part of a church. But you serve on the leadership yeah. team. You're part of the preaching team. Yeah. Why, why that invested in the process? Well, I think we all have a responsibility to contribute to the church, not just to sit back. I mean, Ephesians 4 is a passage that gets argued about exactly what it means. But one of the key things there is it talks about you know, the, the offices in the church, you know, including right. pastor, teacher, evangelist, all that. Sure. But it says that they are, their job is not to do the work of the ministry, to, right. but to equip others to do the work of the ministry. Right. And so we all have a responsibility to do the ministry. Whatever our call is, whatever our gift is, everyone is different. Mm-hmm. Um, someone will be an eye, someone will be a voice. Sure. I happen to be a bit of a voice. It happens online, happens in the church. So why would I not use the gift that God has given me right. in my local context, but use it a, a wide? I think if you do do that, you, you almost lose the right to have a voice, I think. I think it's very important to ask when we listen to these voices that are online, uh, where are they rooted? Where are they grounded? Who's responsible for them? Who's accountable to them? Who could you write a letter to? I mean, if I wrote something online, uh, obviously you can write to me first if you thought it's a load of rubbish, but you could write to my pastor, and sure. th- th- there's a covering there, and a, right. a connection there, it's sure. a mutual accountability there. Yeah, I think that's helpful, and one of the things that I think, you know, most of our audience are pastors and church mm. leaders, and one of the things I want to hear, I want them to hear is that there are probably lay people in their churches who yeah. really need to be in positions of leadership that Oftentimes we, we I sort have of a resist. problem with the, t- the term lay. I sure, really do sure. because we're a kingdom of priests. Right. I mean, the Bible says that. And I mean, the, the Reformation was supposed to reclaim the idea of the priesthood of sure, yeah. all believers. Mm-hmm. And yet, you know, many churches struggle with volunteers. We, we have a lot of volunteers at Jubilee. And, and, and that's, I think that by modeling it, I'm helping other people to do the same thing. But we sure. have to realize that not everyone needs to work for the church as some kind of career goal as a Christian. Right. You, you don't have to succeed as a Christian and be paid by by the church. I'm, I'm not paid by the church. I don't want to be paid by the church. You know? um, and, and I know that uh, the Apostle Paul used to sure. make tents. So right. this notion that you have to be in professional ministry, I mean, there's a place for professional right. ministry. Of course there is. Sure. Uh, but there's also a massive place for people to serve in a way that, that then their gifts match up to the needs of the church and blessing result. You know, one of the things, uh, I've, all I've basically done my entire life is be a pastor until I, you know, came right. to work for Lifeway, um, you know, 16, 17 months ago, and now mm. I'm back on staff at a local church here as a pastor. But one of the things that I found, Adrian, when I came here, and I lost my identity as a pastor, mm-hmm. uh, is that I fear one of the reasons why we resist the priesthood of all believers, we resist helping, quote, the laity engage in ministry, is sometimes pastors, we're guilty of sort of self-medicating through ministry, right? It's the way we kind of feel good about ourselves. And I think one of the ways we push back against that is by helping broaden the field of leadership in the church. But I think that's right. But it makes your church more effective as well. That's the reality. Because, you know, look at me. I'm I'm a a body. Uh, And if I was to put this arm behind my back throughout the rest of the interview... I would still be able to speak, I guess, sure. but it might not be quite as... It would feel a bit weird. I mean, It'd it's already odd. feeling weird now. Right. Uh, but if I was to put both hands behind my back and to tie my hand over my mouth, then it would become completely ineffective. Sure. And I think that's the problem. Many people try and do church as though the pastor is the only person to, to right. do ministry, and that's just wrong. Right. And it, 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 the church suffers, but the pastor also suffers, and I think it's a major reason for pastoral burnout and for those people leaving the ministry, and thousands of them do. And I think, I think, it has to, I think you're right, and I think we have to see churches push back and sort of resist mm. that model, because churches, particularly in a consumer culture, oh, yeah. we enjoy it, right? Yeah. We want, we'll sit back and let them feed us. But then I think pastors have to stop receiving their affirmation, right? Their yeah, self-value exactly. from that. And exactly. so well, let, me, let me talk to you about this, because you, you write often, you speak yeah. often about the topic of the Holy Spirit right. in particular. <laughs> you smile when we start bringing that one up. You, in fact, just recently I was reading a post you wrote this week about a writer who wrote in and, yeah. and said, you know, they're, they've got a newfound appreciation yeah. for the Spirit. I find that oftentimes we, you know, in evangelical life, we refer to the Holy Spirit as an it and not a person. Yeah. Uh, wow. And one of the things that I think serves this priesthood of all believers, engaging all people yeah. in, is recognition of the Holy Spirit. So how do yeah. you... Um, how do you think that we've underestimated and underappreciated the work of the Spirit in our churches? Well, I think one of the key things is this assumption that somehow you get it all at salvation. Now, I do want to say right up front, obviously, every single believer has the work of the Holy Spirit in them. 
I think there's no question about that. The Holy Spirit is involved in causing us to be born again. The Holy Spirit is involved in, even before that, convicting of a sin and righteousness. The Holy Spirit is involved in every believer, transforming them into the likeness of Christ, fruits of the Spirit. But the problem is that I think for many Christians, it's a bit like the wind. Mm -hmm. You know the wind is there by the things you see the wind doing. You can't see the wind. You can't experience the wind itself. And so for me, I think one of the key things is to move beyond this idea of the Holy Spirit as a power or as a force or as something that is something, you know, that is at work in us in some vague way. And actually, to use the words of Peter, he says to receive the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, the Apostle Peter, when he was asked, what must we do to be saved? At the end of the first ever sermon, says, repent, be baptized, and you will receive the Spirit. And, and then, obviously, it talks about joining the church a little bit later on. And to me, those four elements are critical. And the one about the Holy Spirit, it does give us more boldness if we consciously receive the Holy Spirit. Consciously welcome the Holy Spirit is a way of showing how dependent we are on God as well. So, look, Holy Spirit, I need your help here. I need you to give me wisdom here, which is one of the things the Spirit does. Uh, I need you to reveal Jesus in me and through me uh, and and we none of us none of us get to the point where we should stop doing that i mean paul tells us in, in ephesians 5 to be filled with the spirit and that's actually present continuous and pentecostals charismatics like myself like to make this point but it's very valid that really we should translate that as be being filled with the spirit it's not a once for all thing that happens sometime before it's a continuous thing where we as children really come to the father and say give us the Holy Spirit, come to Jesus and say, give us the Holy Spirit. It sounds like in your description, you're affirming basically just a welcoming of yes. the Spirit, yes. an acknowledgement, which well, I that's think a is... a big step. I, and I do, and that's my point. I think oftentimes, and, and this is not, you know, this is across the board, yeah. I think charismatics, non-charismatics yeah. would agree on this point, that oftentimes we minimize the presence and yes. the work of the Spirit. Yes. Again, we refer to it as an it, not a person. Yeah. And, uh, and Galatians says, you know, you, you foolish Galatians, you started with the Spirit, are you now carrying on in the flesh? Sure. And I think that could be a description of many churches where if the Holy Spirit was taken out of the equation, everything would carry on. Mm-hmm. The, and it, no one would really notice because you know, it's all about the latest pragmatic thinking, the latest techniques. Nothing wrong with any of those sure, things. Sure. But if the Holy Spirit isn't being consciously welcomed, if the Holy Spirit... I mean, everyone always used to talk about unction or the anointing sure. on a preacher, for example. Sure. Uh, and if that's present or absent, I mean, I think you can see that very, very clearly on a man like Piper. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people say, oh, it's just he was a great man. He was a stammerer as a mm-hmm. boy. Right. But the Holy Spirit came on him and gave him a gift that was for the whole church. And sure. we need to be much more conscious of that, much more welcoming of that, and much more um, uh, pursuing of that, really. Yeah, I think that's helpful, and I think that's encouraging. And I think as we encourage, um, you know, I, I just I know in my own life, uh, both personally, privately, mm. and corporately in, in my church, you know, I've tried to become v- much more conscious of, Praying at, for yeah. instance, the beginning of a sermon. Yeah. Holy Spirit, you know, we affirm your presence here. We yes. ask you to work among us, you know, that yeah. sort of thing. And I think just this acknowledgement, but, but even beyond that, not just in the preaching, I think even beyond that, when we acknowledge that in the mm. church, we see all people in the church engaged, yeah. faithfully leading and, and engaging yeah. in the church. Now, let, let's turn the corner now. Let's, let's talk a little bit about Raised with Christ, okay. because I'd like to take for a few minutes a fantastic book. I've read it, recommended by folks like Ed Stetzer, Johnny Erickson Tata. I got to interview her just a couple of weeks ago, which an incredible mm. woman. Al Mohler, um, which is a fairly it's, diverse group of folks. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, but that's kind of a who's who of recommendations, Mark Driscoll. Um, so the, the premise of the book, ultimately, the subtitle is How the Resurrection Changes yeah. Everything. I think the pushback might be from some Christians, well, wait a minute, what do you mean? We're a resurrection people. Of course we acknowledge yeah. the resurrection. What do you mean? That when, when you say that the resurrection changes everything. Well, it's a little bit like the Holy Spirit. I don't think there's a Christian today who doesn't believe in the Holy Spirit. Sure. And in actual fact, it, it goes beyond that. You, it's not even just evangelicals. It, I would argue that the one defining mark of all Christians, anyone today really who names the word Christian, and all through history, probably about the only thing we all agree on is that the empty tomb. Sure. Jesus rose again. Sure. But the point is this. We don't tend to talk about it much. Okay. Um, in fact, one of the things that fascinated me as I, was, as I was studying the book is that even if you look at church history, there's never really been a theological controversy about the meaning of the resurrection. Sure. So we take it as a given. We assume it's happened. But the doctrinal development that comes as a result of, hey, we need to call a church council here. You know, we need to discuss, you know, what did the cross do? So you have right. penal substitution. What did this right. do? What about the Trinity? It never happened. So the doctrine of the resurrection and exactly how that, how that is involved in, in our salvation and also in our ongoing Christian walk is something that's virtually never talked about. I could find almost no book that talked about that. 
uh, when I wrote about it. There's been one or two more since. Sure. But particularly the implications of the resurrection. Yes, we talk about it apologetically, but the implications of the resurrection is what I really wanted to hone in on with the book. You said something helpful, I think, just a minute ago, Adrian, when you said we've assumed the yeah. resurrection, right? And so I think the truth is whatever we assume will eventually be lost. Yes. Anything that's assumed yes. will eventually be lost. We've, we've heard some... Uh, fairly influential pastors arguing that about the gospel yes. in recent years, right? We've assumed the gospel, yeah. therefore we've lost the gospel, that thing. Um, Easter's on its way. It's just around yeah. the corner. And so, of course, Easter is, we're going to talk about the resurrection. Yeah. You're going to hear it. Maybe the only sermon the church yes. will hear all year long on the resurrection. Um, in what ways, you say that we've sort of de-emphasized the resurrection. In what ways do we see it played out that we've, we don't emphasize the re- resurrection? It's not influencing sure. our behavior and our theology. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that the resurrection did was, you know, it says that Jesus, as a result of the resurrection, became a life-giving spirit. So that whole okay. thing we were just talking about, about the, sure. ho- the world of the Holy Spirit, seems to be intimately connected with that. Uh, I think also, though, um, if you focus only on the cross, mm-hmm. which a lot of us do, right. the, the danger is that we become introspective and focused on our sin, and we forget that the cross is as empty as the tomb, actually. Right. That the work is finished. Right. Um, and so, for example, um, very commonly people will talk about justification, meaning just as if I'd never sinned, which is right. true. Sure. But it's only one side of it. Mm-hmm. The reality is that the resurrection was really Jesus' justification. It was his declaration of righteousness, not just that he'd never sinned, but that he'd actually completed uh, a holy life. And that that righteousness is credited to our account. So many Christians imagine it, that they've got a blank slate. Right. Um, And that they therefore have to work very hard Mm -hmm. to make sure that they don't mess up the slate, which of course we do. Whereas the reality is Jesus looks at us and we're hidden in the risen Christ and he sees us as righteous. I mean, he looks at us, he sees Jesus, he sees that perfection, that holiness. And that's all there in the resurrection. And in fact, it's interesting, Paul says that he was raised for our justification. And so he ties justification to the resurrection more than the cross. So then let me ask you this question. I'm a pastor, I'm a church leader, and I'm trying to think about applying this with my people, right? And and we've used sort of broad terms about how this influences. How does this change a Christian's behavior tomorrow? Well, you see, the resurrection brings hope. Sure. And hope changes everything. Right. Um, Because it's only through the resurrection that you can look uh, a woman in your church whose husband has just died in the eye and say, look, your husband was a believer. You're going to see him one day. Now, you will grieve, but you're going to grieve in a different way to the world because you have hope. And I think the world is a mess. Right. And there's a lot of pain in it. And without that hope, it's hard to keep going. And I think with that hope, it makes a big difference. You know... N.T. Wright in his book, Surprised by Hope, suggested that this resurrection motif is the entire motif of Scripture. I remember remember reading that and sort of, it was kind of like, it took my breath away, I think, for the first time. Well, that's right, because what is the problem of sin? The problem of sin is that it causes death. Right, right, Death entered the world through sin, according to Romans, and resurrection is the solution to that. And you know, it's interesting to me, it's intriguing that I think we've become, in a sense, modern day Gnostics, okay? Mm-hmm. Follow me here. Gnostics argued flesh, bad, spirit, good, yes. right? Yes, yes. And so I, I feel like sometimes today, you know, we, we just await that ultimate escape of this yeah. world, right? The, God's yes. going to, we're going to yeah. leave this old world goodbye. You know, we, we sing those old songs. But resurrection teaches and reminds us yeah. that what we have here was created flesh, yeah. Yes. Flesh and spirit created by God and said by God, it is good. Yeah. And then sin entered the equation and started destroying this. And so resurrection, not just the resurrection of Jesus, but the resurrection yeah. of all things is, yes. is a reminder of the removal of sin and the restoration yes. of yeah, how God designed it to be. Yeah, and I think that's right. And I think, you see, this is the thing. Some people talk about, you know, too heavenly minded to be of any earthly use. Sure. But actually the reality is this. If you are totally confident that that day is coming when there'll be no more pain, no more suffering, when we will all have resurrected bodies that will you know, never have sickness again, and all of that, then I think that confidence brings you into this world and you dare to pray in a much more meaningful way what Jesus told us to say, your kingdom come, your will be done now on earth, right. as it is in heaven, as it will be on that day. Or Let the powers of the age to come break through in today. We're not going to see it in big way, but we are going to see little glimpses of that all the time, a deposit people talk about, guaranteeing our inheritance. This is intimately connected to the idea of kingdom, which is, again, a theological concept that we have not talked about for a long time in evangelical world. It's kind of been missing. In fact, it's interesting that you mention that. Uh, The sermon I preached nine days ago at my church was entitled Heavenly Minded or No No Earthly Good, good. right? And so if we're not heavenly minded, we're not earthly good. And and yet this idea that, that we are ambassadors of the kingdom... We are resurrected now. Yeah. And I think sometimes when it comes to resurrection, we think 
You know, I get that I'm, my life is messed up. It's difficult. Someday Jesus is going to resurrect yeah. me, and then it's all going to be right. And we forget that resurrection has already occurred. Yeah. We I are mean, resurrected. Paul says now. we're raised with Christ. That's we've right. We've been made alive, Ephesians 2. And I think that's the other fundamental point about the resurrection is that actually Christ is living in us. You know, yeah. the life we now live, we live by faith in the Son of God, and he lives in us, and he empowers us. And resurrection power is pulsating through the body of every believer. That's I like the that description. And, and I think that the key then is that enables us to live now. Yeah. As resurrected people. I mean, that's what it looks like yeah. to live as kingdom residents. Yes. We reflect the kingdom. In fact, I, I think the way I've, I've tried to describe it is we live now as we will live then. Yes. Right? And yes. so that's what the resurrection does for us. Yeah, I, think I, mean, that's I remember a guy who, who was stuck in a wheelchair, had terrible pain. He had ankylosing spondylitis. He told me that he, he, he wouldn't take a, a, a dr- an, any anesthetic when he was having teeth done because there was no point because the pain he experienced every wow. day was worse than that. And yet... He was so convinced that there was a day coming when Jesus would heal him, where he would have a new body, Mm -hmm. that actually he oozed joy. I mean, I've never known anyone who oozed the joy of the Lord more than this guy. He was a pastor Mm -hmm. and a wheelchair. Imagine going to see him and saying, I've had a bad week. Right. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? No, not that bad. You know, well, listen, when I interviewed uh, Johnny Erickson Tata just two or three weeks ago, I was so astonished by the depth of her joy and the depth of her satisfaction in Jesus in spite of physical limitations. That's right. Limitations that would make me cry. Yeah. I mean, I'd curl up in the, in the corner and cry. And don't be wrong, she cried as well. Sure, sure, absolutely, right. But, but her hope found yeah. in the resurrection is radically changed. So this exactly. is not just, an, you know, just a sort of otherworldly concept, theological yeah. concept that pastors should argue over. I mean, this is substantive life change that exactly. you're talking about here exactly. when we get the resurrection. So let me ask you this. What would churches, what would it look like in a local church setting if churches began to emphasize the resurrection, if it began wow. to change their perspective? Well, I think it should be a much happier place. Okay. I mean, sure. it was Lloyd Jones who said at the end of his life when he had to become a, a pew dweller rather sure, than a right. preacher that he felt the churches were miserable places mm-hmm. and that there was no joy in them. Sure. And that, you know, he wondered that anyone went to, went to church. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, I think that, that view of church is, is, is not entirely without its, its Man, merits even today. Right. Um, and so I think, you know, we need hymns and songs that celebrate the resurrection, not just commemorate the cross. You know? sure. And I, it's interesting because I think one of the best hymns of modern time is most well loved is In Christ Alone, which yeah. does talk about the death of Christ, but it right. also talks about his resurrection and the glory of that. And I think that should bring a passion and a life and a vitality and a joy to us. But, and, and I think, again, and I, I don't want to harp on this too much, but I think one of the realities is this resurrection is not just a future concept. Yes. I mean, it's not just it's us pining for something yeah. else. Exactly. It's enjoying the resurrection now. Exactly. Experiencing resurrected life now. Um, if you were, you know, pastors and church leaders are watching this, if you were to say to them, the resurrection matters. Yes. The resurrection does change everything, yes. like the book says. How would you encourage them to go about um, emphasizing the resurrection in their sermons or in their yeah. church structure, church environment? Well, what, what can we do? I think one of the first things to do is to ask yourself honestly the question, do I emphasize it? I mean, I look back at a tract I wrote when I used to go and speak at, at Speaker's Corner. Sure. And I used to like, I, I decided to write my own tract to hand out. And I looked at that a few years later and realized that I'd never even mentioned the resurrection in it. Mm-hmm. My gospel was something like this. Jesus died for my sins, was punished, that I wouldn't have to be. Mm-hmm. And that's only half the gospel. If that's right. your gospel message, and it is very often the gospel message in a good evangelical church, you've missed, actually you could argue you've missed the very announcement of the gospel. Because what does Paul say? He says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And if we're never proclaiming that message, how do we expect anyone to get saved? Right. And it's, it's a, it, it really is, you're right about this, and I'm not so sure that, that a lot of people have thought through this. It's a yeah. dour yeah. perspective on the gospel. It is. If, if we leave, leave out him the, the resurrection, if, exactly. we, if we finish the day on Friday night and it's, we never get to Sunday. It's miserable. Yeah, it is. One of the things we've taken to at our church, and this is just a small thing, Adrian, but we've taken to, and I've been doing this for a few years as a pastor, we refer to every Sunday as Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Very good. You know, when we, we welcome to this Resurrection Sunday, we're celebrating today yeah. again the resurrection of Jesus. Not just Easter Jesus. Sunday. Not just Easter. In fact, we try and make a point yeah. of that. We, if, if you're only celebrating Resurrection Sunday once a year, it's a pretty yeah. destructive and, and sad way to live a Christian yeah, it's life. Yeah, I mean, book sales of this book always go up around Easter, and that's good. I'm glad about that, and it's sure. inevitable. But that's good. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I think uh, many people will read a book about the cross all year round, right. but will only even think about reading a book about the resurrection at Easter. So, um, why do you think it is that we've misunderstood the resurrection? I mean, why have we run away from the resurrection and run to the cross? Well, and I'm, I'm, let me be careful there. 
We need to run to the cross. Yes, I'm not trying do. to de-emphasize no, the cross at all. We need both. But why have we fixated there and not thought about the resurrection? I, I, think, I think because that was the battleground. Sure. I mean, if you think about the Reformation, really the evangelical movement today still sits in the, in the benefit of the, resurre- of the Reformation. It's still a continuation of the protest of the Reformation. Sure. And that was really all about the meaning of the cross and the idea that, you know, penance was finished sure. because, you know, sure. the price had been paid. But here's the thing. The other side of that message is that, therefore, Jesus rose again because right. precisely the price had been paid. And I think that, you know, the emphasis was so much on that, rightly so. Mm-hmm. There was so much theological argument about that that we just kind of, yeah, 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 we believe the resurrection. I mean, the Catholics believe the resurrection. Sure. We don't need to fight them There's about no that. There's no distinction there. Um, right. Sure. But I, but I think, you know, it's something we need to fight for today, for sure, because, you know, it's such a radical idea that certainly your average atheist is not going to believe in the resurrection, for no. sure. No. And it is, as you said, the one distinguishing characteristic of Christianity throughout all of human history. Yeah. Yeah, that's encouraging. Pastors, I hope um, that you will grab a copy of Raised with Christ. Again, if you're just watching this on the website, you can look at the screen uh, right below. I'm sorry, right below the screen. You'll see a link to Raised with Christ. You can grab a copy for yourself. Fantastic book, extremely helpful. Our guest today is Adrian Warnock. We're so thankful to have him here with us all the way from across um, over in the UK. We're going to come back in just a few minutes, and we're going to continue, continue the conversation not only with Adrian, but Rice Brooks is here in studio with us as well. Rice Bro- wrote a book that's become kind of popular. Yes. <laughs> recently, a book called God's Not Dead. And, of course, there's a movie about, by the same name that released in a limited number of theaters this past weekend and has just been tremendously successful. And so we're going to continue this conversation. Adrian is here in town speaking with, uh, at Rice's church and, and spending some time with Rice. And so we're going to bring Rice up on the platform with us and spend some time with him talking about this book and the movie and how you can use the movie as a springboard to help advance the gospel in your communities. I'm excited about this. Uh, We're going to show the trailer to the movie and then we'll come right back. So go ahead and watch this. We'll be back with Rice here in just a second. All this stuff is temporary. Money, success, even life is temporary. Jesus, that's eternal. And that's it? That's it. That's what we're going with. I'm Professor Radisson. This is philosophy 150. This semester, I propose that we refuse to waste our limited time together debating the existence of the big man in the sky. Fill in the papers I've just given you with three little words. God is dead. I can't do what you want, I'm a Christian. We've gotten your results back. You have cancer. The answer's simple. Drop the class. It's like it's something that God wants me to do. I can't just turn away from it. Somehow. You really should go see Mom. What's in it for me? If you cannot bring yourself to admit that God is dead, then you will need to defend the antithesis. God's not dead. He's surely alive. He's You're here because that voice inside you isn't happy with the choices everyone else wants you to make. It's not easy. It's simple. Mr. Wheaton, are you ready? We're going to put God on trial. What do you say to people who don't believe? If we disown him, he'll disown us. You think you're smarter than me, Wheaton? Do you think there's any argument you can make that I won't have an answer for? In that classroom, there is a God, and yet, I'm him. It doesn't seem quite fair to me. I can't help what a boy wants to make a fool of himself. Look, I know I am in the minority here, but I actually believe in God. I think you're here kind of hoping that this stuff is for me. I'm praying for you. To me, he's not dead. He's alive. What I want is for them to make their own choice. That's what God wants. You just want to ensnare them in your primitive superstition. Why do you hate God? Science supports his existence. You know the truth. So why do you hate him? Why do you hate God? Welcome back to The Exchange. Normally, Ed Stetzer is uh, here with us, uh, but he is out of the country this week. My name is Micah Fries, the Vice President of LifeWay Research. So thankful uh, to be here with you. Remember, if you have uh, questions or comments to engage with us on social media using either The Exchange hashtag, it's just hashtag The Exchange, or engage with our brand new uh, Twitter handle, which is Exchange underscore show. 
and we'd love for it if you'd follow that and uh, if you'd maybe retweet it. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to use that, and I want you to use Ed Stetzer's Twitter handle, which is just at Ed Stetzer. And I want everybody in mass to respond to him and tell him he needs to shave the goatee. Oh. So if you can do that today, we call it the half crowder. It's, it's the, either the wannabe duck dynasty or it's the half crowder goatee. Anyway, I am here with a couple of guests who I'm very thankful for. Adrian Warnock, of course, has been here with us for the past few uh, minutes. Clean shaven. Clean shaven, praise the Lord. All of us are clean shaven. <laughs> and then Rice Brooks, who's a pastor here in the Nashville area. We're so thankful to have you with Thank us, you. Rice. And Rice uh, authored a book entitled God's Not Dead, Evidence for God in an Age of Uncertainty. Would very much encourage you to grab this book. Um, but the book has become much more than a book. I mean, there's uh, the movie God's Not Dead released. Kevin Sorbo sort of is the lead actor, and mm-hmm. the Newsboys provide music, and um, has been extremely successful. I was just looking at the, got the newest data. It was the fourth highest grossing movie of the, re- of the weekend when you took about, talk about per screen average revenue, number three per screen uh, r- revenue. And what's amazing is you look at the major movies like Divergent, almost 4,000 screens, and yet God's Not Dead was on 780 screens yeah. and yet grossed over $9 million this weekend. I mean, that's incredible success for this movie um, that really kind of was birthed out of the book. And so, Rice, why don't we begin with you just kind of walking us through, how did the book come about in the first place? Well, when the song came out, God's Not Dead, I was asked to come into a kind of a marketing meeting, and they were going to throw together, uh, I shouldn't say it like that, but they were going to (laughs) quickly put out a book with different chapters from different, you know, famous apologists, and they wanted me to be an editor of that. Sure. Uh, I uh, taught apologetics out at Fuller Seminary as an adjunct for a few years, and so kind of had a good handle on on the issues. And so I went into this uh, marketing team and I said, look, there's a lot of books on apologetics. Let's do something that once the book is written, there's tools that we can empower people with. Because when you get in a conversation with a skeptic, uh, many times the great book you read, you can't retrieve that information quick enough to make a difference in a conversation. So we'll talk about uh, this thing called the God test. I hate to be shameless, but they need this. So I actually took this tool out that we created that basically is just questions. It's you ask a person, do they believe in God? The God test, if they say yes, it says side B, you have 10 questions for them. If they say no, you have 10 different questions if they're atheist. And I went around the room with this team of marketing folks, and uh, one of the guys named Dean Deal just kind of started almost levitating. He said, you need to write this book. (laughs) And uh, he later told me that years ago he he was talked out of his faith by an atheist. And, uh, and he said he just he had no answers. And here he is in, in Christian work, sure. and yet he was talked out of his faith. And he was driving down the road and I, and here in Nashville, and he said to God, I just can't believe in you anymore. And uh, he heard a voice speak back to him and said, well, who do you think you're talking to? <laughs> so he pulls off to the side <laughs> of the road to, he said, to get his heart right, but he said, I still had to get my head right. Um, coupled with that story, I had an atheist brother who came home from law school, his third year at law school at SMU, to talk me out of the Christian faith right. when I was a new believer. And we baptized him that weekend. So I've had kind of a history. <laughs> so the conversation he's, he's didn't go as well as this guy. <laughs> we, I, I've had a history of helping people. Yeah, so sure. talking to Dean uh, and helping him kind of, he said, look, you're helping me even all these years be able to unpack these questions that I've just buried. So he, I ended up just kind of writing down nine basic arguments for the existence of God, mm-hmm. starting with reason. One of the chapters is called Real Faith Isn't Blind. Mm-hmm. I went down to the Global Atheist Conference in Melbourne writing this book and 3,500 atheists, 2012, Richard Dawkins, Lawrence Krauss, Dan Dennett. Mm-hmm. And the whole theme of the conference was basically that all we have is blind faith. So one of the key evidences is that reason itself. How, how can we account for reason and our ability to understand the world if we came about by no reason right. or for no reason. Right. So Einstein would say the only, the, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe, you've got to get Einstein in there to sound smart, <laughs> Talk, talking in front of a doctor, the most incomprehensible right. thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. And we go from there to the moral argument that good and evil are real, right. to the beginning of the universe, to the, the complexity of life, and then, and then to the resurrection, that Jesus indeed lived, he was a man, uh, he was not some myth like Bill Maher who says that somehow that Jesus was some recapitulation of the uh, Mithras or Osiris or Horus, these sure. ancient Egyptian and Persian myths. But actually Jesus indeed was a man that uh, he lived and he died. And that as we talked about, you talked about in the last segment, that he indeed mm-hmm. was raised from the dead in the very city where it would have been easiest to disprove three days later yeah. after sure. he was crucified. So anyway, I'm, 
I'm telling this, what I'm doing in writing this book to a friend of mine named Troy Duhon, who's a businessman, and he basically calls Pure Flix and says, I think I've got a movie for you. No kidding. So Pure Flix comes to Nashville. Uh, Michael Scott and Russell Wolf, who are the two main guys there, they sit with me. I kind of give them the scenarios of what we do on campuses. I'm actually uh, a part of a ministry called Every Nation, mm-hmm. which we're in many different countries, and we're on over 700 college campuses, so I'm kind of a world's oldest living teenager out on the campus. <laughs> so I kind of describe the scenarios of, of engaging college students, of professors who are challenging back. Uh, there's a Chinese character in the movie who was inspired by me telling them about a local legend here in Nashville named Ming Wang. No Ming is a medical doctor who came from China as an atheist to Harvard, Mm -hmm. and his Harvard professor led him to Christ. So I described that journey, and so they've depicted a character in the movie that's uh, inspired by Ming's life. And uh, then ultimately worked with them on forming an apologetic scenario. So at the heart of the movie are these three classroom confrontations where where this uh, young freshman... Shane Harper, better, otherwise known as Shelby on Good Luck Charlie, if you're a Disney fan, <laughs> your kids are, uh, and he presents these arguments to, to Kevin Sorbo, and that's kind of the meat of the, of the movie, and that's really where I helped craft the, the drama of a campus and what goes on, and then what do you say if someone says, what is your evidence to prove God exists or to demonstrate that he exists? So. I think one of the reasons why this is helpful We talked in the last segment, anything that's assumed is ultimately lost or forgotten, right? And I think when it comes to uh, the logical side of our faith, you know, the reasons for the existence of God, this is one of those areas where we are ill-equipped to have these conversations as Christians. I think this is helpful to us to sort of prepare Christians to be able to answer those questions. Yeah, I mean, I think it's even worse than that. We're not only ill-equipped, we actually feel that we're on the back foot. We sure. feel that the atheist arguments are stronger. Mm-hmm. There is so much prominence given to sort of people like Richard Dawkins that I think many Christians feel like they've kind of won the argument and all we've got left is blind faith, really. I and, think many and, people uh, feel he that. He has your wonderful accent. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, if, you're, if you're an atheist, wish we had that. Accent, so we need. Yeah. And Adrian has been fantastic. I mean, the movie debuts in London on April 11th. Wow, okay. So I'll be over there and Adrian has been so helpful. He's you know, they, they have a large church, church network in New Frontiers, and he's been connecting with everything. I'll be on the BBC, thanks to Adrian, on uh, Sunday morning, April 6th. So uh, really, really excited about it. And it goes to many countries. It's going, I'll be down in uh, Australia in May, sure. uh, South Africa, it's, uh, Kenya is April 5th. That's incredible. So just all these different countries. So, yeah, we're really, really, we're hoping that it starts this conversation uh, that shows us that, indeed, that there is, a, there is reasonable there is a reason to have faith. There is a, there's a logical reason. But yet ultimately, and I think the thing is we do have faith. Right. But the question is, are the, is the step of faith we take uh, a reasonable step? Is it a step in the right direction or the wrong direction? Based on all that God's done through, mm-hmm. he, through creation, through morality, through him demonstrating who he is at the cross and the resurrection, uh, the step to believe in him and to trust what we can understand is a sure step. Mm. So, yes, faith is, faith is critical. But it's not blind faith. It's reasonable to trust in God. Adrian was mentioning earlier a few of the stories you've already heard this weekend of people who have just been significantly affected by the movie. Do you have maybe just one or two stories you could tell us of of lives who have already been, even just this weekend? Well, if you just follow Twitter, there's just standing ovations in many cities. Because I guess of the limited theater space, 800 theaters, then people are waiting in line. But uh, there have been altar calls. People have come down front to, to get saved. I see people yeah. on Twitter that say, I've been saved. So if you go to hashtag God's Not Dead or hashtag yeah. God's, God's Not Dead movie, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of these stories are yeah. being chronicled. But, yeah, I think uh, one kid texted 300 of their friends. That's, I remember you telling me. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. After the movie. Yeah, it is. Uh, and and uh, this week is important. Noah's coming out. So right. we're hoping that we That's survive right. the flood of Noah. <laughs> <laughs> and we make That's it the through truth. the deluge. And uh, it will expand, uh, just got off a call, it will expand to almost 1,100 theaters. Is that right? And so if we make it through this as we approach Easter, we're really hoping that it's that this will be a service to the churches. Um, so let's, let's talk about that then, right? Because we, we've got about two minutes left. If, if There's lots of folks who are watching who are thinking, okay, this is great, it's a movie. How do, we, how do we help transition that to become a tool that's used by people and churches to advance the gospel? You know, yeah, well, of first of all, there's, uh, if you go to godsnotdead.org, okay. there's, there's sermon series, mm-hmm. there's posters, there's small group material, all free. Okay. So we have many churches that are doing six-week sermon series. So we have the outlines there, we have the small group material. 
we just want you to, to get involved. And of mm-hmm. course, we'd like you to read the book. Sure. We, if you go to the uh, godsnotdead.org website, mm-hmm. uh, then you have God Test. All these training videos are free. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anything like that that uh, can get your people from listening to a message right. to actually out engaging lost people. You know, Ed and I uh, have this conversation about 3% of churches in America are growing through evangelism. Right. That's an estimate. Sure. And most of that 3% is a come and see and versus a go and tell. Mm-hmm. So what we're, if we can just move that, that just a few percentage points to where we're empowering people mm-hmm. to go and tell versus, right. hey, come and see. My pastor is a really good speaker. And I think the pastor would appreciate that, yeah, I want to speak and I hope they come and hear me. Mm-hmm. But what a powerful thing to actually empower your people to be able to go out mm-hmm. and have these conversations uh, with people, and and that's what we're helping people do. We hope this movie, if nothing else, helps start that conversation. Well, I I'm, I'm so thankful for both of you all joining us today. We're thankful for your your tribes. We love every nation. You're good friends. We're we're good friends with New Frontiers. We're so thankful for you all joining with us. And and I love I love the fact that again, as we said, the evangelical world is is flattening a little bit, mm-hmm. and we're seeing mm-hmm. partnerships to advance the gospel. And I think particularly the book of Philippians. That's the whole theme of the book of Philippians, partnering together to advance the gospel. And this is just another incredible tool. Um, God's not dead, both the book and the movie, and then this God test. We would really encourage you to go ahead and take advantage of these resources if you can. And that's Thank the GodTest.org. Sorry the for GodTest.org. the promotion, but nope, so that's good. We want to make sure and get that website. website. The GodTest.org for that resource as well. And, uh, of course, Adrian Warnock, and, and we're, we appreciate you traveling a long way. I think you just about win the, the award for the longest travel for yeah. any guest. We've had another couple of... Uh, guests from Great Britain, but not very many. <laughs> We're so thankful for you all joining us. Thank you again, as usual, for you all joining us each week. Remember to engage with us on Twitter, on social media, hashtag the exchange, our brand new uh, Twitter handle, exchange underscore show. Make sure you let Ed know to shave the goatee. I'd appreciate it. We'll see you next week. <laughs>